And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. Uh, top secret location today, 1233 American Legion Drive, Festus, Missouri. Google Maps blots out. If, I don't know if you've ever looked at a map and tried to find us on a map like Google Maps. Uh, they blot it out because it's a top secret facility and nobody can know anything about it. I just made that up just now. I remember reading an article uh, yesterday, day before that, something like that. Uh, there's a guy who is piecing together satellite data. And I, I don't know if you know this or not. If you go like uh, earth.google.com or Google Earth or Google Maps or anything like this, and some of the others I imagine will do it too, the United States government you know, the, uh, the organization, most powerful organization in the world that wants to know everything there is to know about you but doesn't want you to know deadly about them. They have instructed Google and these other mapping agencies to blot out where all the... Um, military bases are and so they fuzz it out somehow some way so that you can't I mean, you go looking for area 51 and it's blotted out or some of these other military organ uh, bases that are secret that they deny the existence of even though everybody knows it's right there uh, there's a guide I don't know how he's doing it but he's piecing together what's been blotted out uh, on these uh, on these web mapping sites, and I, I don't know if it's going to get him in any trouble or not, but I uh, applaud him for what he's doing. So if you just happen to go to Google Earth or Google Maps or MapQuest or anything like that and go to looking for our top secret broadcasting bunker, you will find it right at Area 52, 1233 American Legion Drive, Festus, Missouri. 63028, just in case you need the, um, the zip code. I don't know the other four numbers at the end of it. I'm in one of those moods today. I have uh, some pieces of paper here that I'm going to read unless I am looking for a good reason to just crack open a fresh can of King James and talk about it. That's what I'm doing. I'm just sitting here going, okay, I can read this, and I can go through this, and we can talk about this, and, and so on. And um, I am just looking for a reason to just do nothing for the next two hours but study the Word of God. I just don't know where to go yet. So maybe you're sitting out there, and you would just like to study or talk about something in the Bible, or you have a question on your mind. Um, or you want to stir it up with me today uh, by sending me something uh, that says how wrong I am, and then we'll go to the Bible to find out whether or not that is actually true or not. Um, I do have one thing in mind, but I don't know if I'm going to deal with it today or not. But if you bring it up, we'll deal with it. Let me, uh, the email address is on the bottom, pastormonkonline at gmail.com. Um, I had mentioned on the um, one of the Facebook groups uh, that I'm I'm looking for some quotations from uh, some of these so-called Christian leaders. I've I've heard I used to hear that I used to listen to a lot of Christian radio back years ago. Um, I would listen to Chuck Smith and I would listen to Charles Swindoll and I would listen to Peter Lore or Greg Laurie and I would listen to all this and that and the other. Even Joyce every now and then. That was back way back when. And uh, you'd hear him talk about Christian leaders. Christian leaders are saying this, and Christian leaders are doing this. I'm going, oh, yeah, like these guys are the Christian leaders. I grew up and matured a little bit, understood that in your life, there really should only be a very select few number of Christian leaders and they, according to Scripture, would be the elders or the presbytery in your local church and your pastor. 
That's who your leaders are. But as far as listening to old Chuck, either Chuck Swindoll or Chuck Smith uh, or Steve Brown or any of these other guys, uh, who made them the leader? Who put them in charge? Who decided that since they have a multi-million dollar ministry and they're on the radio five days a week, who decided that these guys get to call the shots? Because I'm sitting back and I'm going, you know, the shots they're calling, uh, that's not right according to the scriptures. That's not right in the Bible. Uh, but these guys have been elevated to the status of Christian leadership and pretty much whatever they say goes. But I was looking for quotations from these Christian leaders, uh, many of them, not all of them. Some of them won't touch the subject of why they hate the King James Bible, and some of them do. Some of them, they, they try to sound spiritual by saying, we believe the King James is an excellent translation of the Bible, and it's the beauty of its poetry is unmatched by any... And they always talk about the poetry and the poetic language of the Bible. Down deep inside, they don't read it and they don't like it anymore. And they don't want to use it anymore. Um, I do have a I do have a thing that I'm going to. Um, I'll tell you what I'm working on and why I want this. And if you want to send something like that in, uh, don't send me a two-hour video to watch. I don't have time to watch it. Uh, but send me a quotation from a video or someone who is saying. This is why we hate the King James Bible. This is why we don't like it. This is why we won't use the King James anymore. This is why we are King James Nunley. Um, if you know of anything like that, send it to me. I already have a, a couple here and there. Uh, one from Doug Stauffer, a couple from uh, Gail Ripplinger. Um, but ever since last, so, well, Thursday, when Sweetie Pie was having her surgery, uh, I was sitting out in the uh, waiting room with my Samsung Note. And uh, I like this thing. It's got a little stylus in it that's designed for writing like you would write on a tablet. And when I keep my notes, I keep them on this one. It's a really, really neat uh, writing tool. But I just found myself just making notes on Second Peter chapter 2, the identification of of wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus told us to watch out for wolves. They would appear in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they would be ravening wolves. And, um, and then he told you, you know, you shall know them by their fruit. And so Second Peter, along with Jude, gives you the fruit to look for, shows you the signs to look for. So I just sat there and started making notes, and all throughout the weekend, being home with Sweetie Pie and so on, that's what I found myself doing. Yesterday, that's what I'm doing. Even this morning, a little bit, that's what, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm putting together um, a, right now, all it is is just a PowerPoint presentation on the signs of the wolves of, of, in sheep's clothing. It's going to be very, very, very detailed um, it's one of those things that, again, I'm going to take my time going through it. It'll be, it'll be about a 30 minute video, not, um, but just to show all the signs of wolves in sheep's clothing, um, false prophets, false teachers, false doctrine, things like that. Uh, and I can't get away from it. It just seems like every time I'm sitting, I'm going, what am I going to do now? That's what's there. I don't know when I'm. I don't know when I'm going to fit it in uh, between uh, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, pure Bible study, Pastor Mike online, Watchman video broadcast. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to fit it in. Uh, but if you uh, if you have any quotations like that, send them to me via an email. Send me the quotation and then send me the link uh, to show me, you know, where it came from. Uh, because if I'm going to quote somebody, it has to be verified that they actually said this. Not that I knew a guy that heard so-and-so say something like this. I'm going, okay, how do I know that that's true or not? So send me a quote on that. Uh, but I, I've just been 
wanting a reason to get into the scriptures today. So maybe you can help me out. You send me some emails, pastormikeonline at gmail.com, and we shall look into that. Let me read a couple pieces of paper here. Left-wing psych drug-taking occultists make up majority of mass shooters. As you know, there were over the weekend, there was another school shooting, more video of of children coming out of these public schools with their hands in the air and their pockets pulled out to show law enforcement officials that they don't have any weapons and that they, in fact, are not the shooters. Um, Of course, the left wing wants to jump on this and try to make everybody believe that our problem is guns. We have guns. We don't need guns. We have too many guns. We need to get rid of all the guns. Control the guns. Please control the weapons. And so uh, this is uh, from uh, Infowars.com. An undeniable pattern has continued to emerge in light of mass shootings. Despite the media's attempt to avoid connecting the dots in the wake of recent high-profile shootings, the media can almost immediately be seen attempting to link deranged shooters with the political right. And I'll just, I'm going to set the record straight. There's nothing about my shooting that's deranged. I'm pretty much on target every time I hit, every time I fire. Um, As facts come in, the desire to connect shooters to their political ideologies quickly erodes as the same antidepressant taking left-wing occultist profile emerges. In 2011, Tucson, Arizona shooter Jared Loeffner, who viciously murdered six people in his unsuccessful attempt to kill U.S. Representative Gabrielle Giffords, was immediately deemed a right-winger. It was soon learned that Loeffner was a left-wing liberal obsessed with drugs, mind control, dressing like the Grim Reaper, and engaging in cult rituals. Sounds like to me we let rock and roll loose in this country and the chickens are coming home to roost is what it sounds like to me. Uh, Despite initial reports attempting to paint the same picture, information now shows that last week's shooter in Colorado, Carl Halverson Pearson, was a devoted and opinionated socialist who blamed gun violence on Republicans. That's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot then, isn't it? Sandy Hook gunman Adam Lanza, who murdered 20 children and six teachers, exhibited identical traits. Although the media attempt to connect Lanza to the NRA, this was later found to be inaccurate. Instead, Lanza, who admittedly had mental health issues, was obsessed with playing video games and updating his online devil-worshipping page. Aurora theater, theater shooter James Holmes, who was falsely labeled a member of the Tea Party by ABC News, was linked to fringe. The guy didn't even like tea. And he was linked to the Tea Party. Silly. Was linked to fringe elements of the Occupy movement by renowned investigator Bill Warner. Hooked on several prescription drugs, including painkillers, Holmes began stockpiling weapons after entering a neuroscience class to learn the inner workings of the human brain. Similarly, going back to the tragic Columbine shooting, left-wing shooters Harrison and Klebold, who referred to themselves as gods, were known to take SSRIs for mental health issues, spending hours playing video games like Doom. The pair reportedly obsessed over death and the occult. The game profile, or the same profile, occult obsessed, left of mass murderers, can be traced back to countless others from the Son of Sam to the Night Stalker to the National Socialist Adolf Hitler. Despite millions of responsible Americans owning firearms to protect against such types, calls to disarm law-abiding citizens have already begun in states like California and New York. Even with gun homicide hitting a 20-year low, the media still refuses to link the common traits of most mass shootings. And I don't always agree with everything I read on InfoWars, but I agree with that one. Um, these, we, we, listen, we have, the chickens are coming home to roost. We have built ourselves a society 
that is obsessed with death, murder, bloodshed. I I have never played, um, what is this, um, Grand Theft Auto? Never play. I don't own a copy of it. Never played it. Um, because we're broadcasting on Justin TV, um, I kind of look around to see what's on there. And Justin TV, they have a Twitch TV now where gamers just basically stream their video games. And apparently that's cool. And so I'm watching this guy playing Grand Theft Auto. And I'm just, I am going, okay, so you are a thug and you shoot and kill people at random and steal their cars. That's what you do in this video game. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I'd, I may not be getting the whole gist of the game right, but apparently that's what it is. You just walk, it's one of them walkthrough shooters. And you find somebody, you yank them out of the car, you beat them senselessly, uh, you shoot them, stab them, whatever you want to do to them, and then steal their ride. That's that's video games. Uh, Pac-Man ate ghosts. We've come a long way, baby. Uh, but I agree with this. We've got our kids psyched up on drugs. I am not necessarily against certain medications, uh, but I, I knew this. Um, when when it when we, we start, start first started hearing children uh, being given Ritalin back in the '90s, every child had to have Ritalin. You go in the public school nurse's office, there'd be a this this gigantic vault of med bottles full of Ritalin. And my philosophy then is pretty much my philosophy now. Uh, instead of using Ritalin, why don't you use Paddlin? When they took whipping out of public schools. And I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you who did it. Let me tell you who took whippings out of public schools. Parents did. It was the parents who threatened the school with lawsuits and vengeance and everything else because their poor child didn't do anything wrong. It was the school's fault or it was somebody else's fault. And some kid got a whipping and some parent blew a gasket over it. And so the schools were just going, why do it? A buddy of mine ran a um, Christian school out in California, and their policy was they endorsed paddlings. But their policy was if your child did something in school, it was a private Christian school worthy of a paddling, they called you. You had to leave work and go to that school and whip that kid yourself. And if you didn't want to do it, you just come get your kid and take him home because he can't go to school here. But they were afraid to touch those kids. We had a Christian school here. I used to paddle kids, and I finally got to where I said, you know what, I ain't doing them. I'm not touching them anymore. I am not going to do it. It was the parents who did this. And that, that, that mindset pervades. I've seen it in churches. I've seen it in this church. I've seen it amongst parents who don't want to let anybody touch their child or hurt their child or say anything to their child because their child never does anything wrong. It's everybody else's fault, and on and on and on and on. And uh, so anyway, that's what's happened. We, we don't touch these children. No child is ever corrected. I knew a uh, group of charismatic parents who brought their kids to our school years ago that um, they had been taught – by their uh, Rodney Howard Browns and their Benny Hens and their Joyce Myerses. In fact, this some of these people were from Joyce Myers Church. They had been taught that if your child does something wrong and you go to that child and confront them with what they did wrong and they repent of it and say, Mom, I'm sorry, 
they were taught you don't touch them after that. No need to punish them. No need to give them any, any uh, repercussions whatsoever because they repented and they're truly sorry for it. And so you leave them. And I'm going, are you kidding me? I would have, when I was nine years old, I would have done anything had I just looked at my mom and said, Mom, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Yes, I'll forgive you and not get a spanking for what I did. I would have done anything for that because I'm going, that's like the coolest thing in the world. All I have to do is go, Mom, I'm so sorry. Will God forgive me? Yes, son, God will forgive you. Oh, And I can get away with whatever I want to. Kids are smart. They know what's going on. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's your mass shootings. Google's future, microphones in the ceiling and microchips in your head. Um, you know what? I'm going to read some emails. I, I ain't kidding. I am just dying to get the Bible out here. Uh, here's an article. I don't have a microchip in my head yet. Says the man charged with transforming Google's relations with technology giants, human users. But Scott Huffman does envisage a world in which Google microphones embedded in the ceiling listen to our conversations and inject verbal answers to whatever inquiry is posed. I know people like that, or I have known people like that. They won't let you finish a sentence, but they're injecting something into your conversation. It's like, uh, yeah, the other day I was at McDonald's. Oh, did you try their new? Oh, you got to try that. Oh, McDonald's is so great. But you got to watch out for McDonald's because they're this, that. And that's what Google's wanting to do. Huffman, Google's engineering director, leads a team tasked with making conversations with the search engine more reflective of the complex interactions people enjoy with each other. The future of the $300 billion business depends upon automatically predicting the search needs of users and then presenting them with the data they need. Computing is becoming so inexpensive that it's inevitable that there will be a ubiquity of connected devices around us from our lapel to our car to Google Glass, said Huffman during a visit to the UCK from the company's California base. A microphone hanging from the ceiling responding to verbal queries would remove the need to whip out a phone to remind yourself what time tomorrow's flight leaves. It could also make sure you don't miss the flight altogether. Like a great personal assistant, it will interrupt you and say, you've got to leave now. It will bring you the information you want, Mr. Huffman said. In fact, Mr. Huffman believes, who has been working on refining search for 15 years, the clunky physical act of typing request into Google search box will gradually recede almost to nothing. I uh, had a conversation with somebody who is sort of in the know about some of the future things that are coming down the road in the internet and that story matches what they shared with me let me read one more here pennsylvanians coerced into giving cheek swab at voluntary checkpoint uh, another story from info wars a supposed voluntary survey checkpoint run by a private firm in reading pennsylvania on behalf of the white house office of national drug control policy caused outrage when residents said they were forced off the road into a car park and coerced into giving cheek swabs as a result of an intimidating police presence have you heard about these They've done it in Missouri. They've done it here. I guess this is here in Pennsylvania. They've done it in other places. When, when it goes on in one place, you go, yeah, okay, you know, what, what, I don't want the what drive. When it goes on in every state of the union, it makes you think, what's going on here? All of a sudden now, we are being volunteered to pull our cars over, get out, open our mouth, get swabbed, 
get ID'd, get checked, for what? Do you remember anything from the days of the Soviet Union? Most of us never lived there. But in the days of the old Soviet Union, you couldn't travel from here to there without somebody checking your papers. Papers, please. Can I see your papers? These papers seem to be out of order. And they could pull you out of the truck or car or the subway or whatever at will and drag you in. For what? Not having page three directly on top of page four. That's all they needed. So they're pulling people over. Let me continue reading this. Um, the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation was hired by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to run the checkpoint during which motorists were quizzed about their driving habits. Reading uh, resident Ricardo Neves said that he had to repeatedly refuse to take part in the survey over a five-minute period before he was allowed to leave. Nieves, maybe it's Neves or Nieves, noted that the presence of city police and a police car with flashing lights was designed to, quote, intimidate motorists into submission and gave the checkpoint an air of authority it would not otherwise have had, according to the Reading Eagle. Nieves told the city council Monday that the company's hiring of police officers to help run the checkpoint was, quote, a gross abuse of power on many levels and that the firm running it refused to divulge why they were demanding to take swabs of people's cheeks, with Nieves asserting clearly it was for DNA. Clearly it was. Why? I have an article here. Let me pull it up on my Evernotes. Um, let's see here. Where is it? Where is it? Where can I find it? Uh, let's see here. Scientists discovered second secret DNA code. Scientists, and this was interesting. I don't have a clue what this means. I don't have the first clue what this story means. Scientists have long believed that DNA tells, uh, tells the cells how to make proteins. But the discovery of a new second DNA code Thursday suggests that the body speaks. Oh, this is interesting. The body speaks two different languages. Dun, dun, dun. The findings in the journal Science may have big implications for how medical experts use the genomes of patients to interpret and diagnose diseases. See, they always say... Now, we're just trying to cure all your, your diseases. That's what we want. That's all we want to do is just cure all of your diseases. That's really all we want to do. Really? Because I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. But they apparently they've discovered a new DNA code, and I would like to have more information about that. And if anybody has it, I would like to see it. Here is another article. Har Havid. University takes first steps toward human cyborgs. Uh, and when I printed this out, I printed it so small I can't even read it. Uh, here is, let me, I am going to show you that. I got pictures today. Let me show you some pictures. And then I'll get into some emails here. This is related to the whole DNA thing. Let me pull that up there on the screen. And I'm going to have to do this and this and that and this. Hang on one second here. I've had my mind so much on wanting to get in the scripture. I haven't done much of anything else here. So let me do this. Let me take it to this and show you that and take away that and minimize that and then go like that. Here we go. Somebody sent me this here a while back. Um, there is a company called Bionim. I want you to notice the logo. One, two, three, four, five. The thing's centered around here. But what is this? Can anybody raise your hand? Don't talk out loud. What is this? It's a keyhole. Now I want you to just ponder that for a minute. A keyhole. Here's our chance right here. Hang on. 
I'm going to reach over and get out my bread basket full of hot-baked King James Bible bread. Did I mention a while ago that there are some people who hate the King James Bible? Did I happen to mention that? I'm not one of them. Revelation 9, verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded. I want to put this back up on the screen. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key. The key of the bottomless pit. What is this right here? It's where the key goes. Um, the company is BioNim. If you don't know what that means, the word NIM, let me give you another word that we have the word NIM in it. Pseudonym. You know what a pseudonym is. You know what a pseuda is. It's a lie. NIM is name. When someone writes a book under a pseudonym, it is not their name like the book of Enoch. That is part of what's called the pseudepigrapha. It is a collection of books that have, have somebody's name on it, and they didn't write it, and the book of Enoch has Enoch's name on it, but it's not in Enoch's handwriting, okay? So we know he didn't write it. Enoch didn't write a book. Um, but that, anyway, the, the word bionym means your biology name. Now, stop right here. We'll go to Revelation 13. And I'm going to read here, because we're looking at a key. We're looking at the name in your biology. What does that sound like to you? Um, Revelation 13, 16, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. There are six groups here. Causeth all. Now, here is where, um, who was it? Came off with this nonsense that you can take the mark of the beast. The very thing that God said, don't take it. You can take the mark of the beast. John MacArthur says this. Um, I can't remember who else said it. Says you can take the mark of the beast, still go to heaven. Don't worry about it. If you take it, don't worry about it. You're still going to go in, no big deal. Because it says he calls us all, and we know from our eschatology charts that there are some people called the tribulation saints that make it all the way through the final seven years of tribulation and, and so on. So obviously... Obviously, if everybody has to take the mark, then obviously some people are going to be saved even though they have the mark. That is idiocy at one of its highest levels is what it is. You've made so many extrapolations from Scripture, and you have built this doctrine. And, and I've been telling people this is how they do it. They start out with something real small and real simple that's not actually mentioned in Scripture, but they make you think that that's what the Scripture is saying. And then they build things on top of it, and by the time you get all the way up here, you have a doctrine that says, well, of course you can take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. And what they've done is they've built their doctrine and their statements upon extrapolations from Scripture, but not the Scripture themselves. And by the time their doctrine comes out, it actually denies the Scripture. And so you're sitting there scratching your head going, uh, wait a minute, um, doesn't the Bible say that everybody who takes the mark is going to be thrown in the lake of fire? What Are you saying that people can take the mark and not get thrown in the lake of fire because God was pretty clear. If you take the mark, you're going to get thrown in the lake of fire. Well, of course, because if this and this and this and this and this and this and this, then it means that they must be able to take the mark and still go to heaven. Folks, that's not Bible doctrine. That's man's ideologies. That's man's, well, I think it's this way, so if it's this way, then it must be this way, then it must be this way here. That's not Bible doctrine. It has nothing to do with it. When it said, read the scriptures, he causeth all, 
And the Bible says, walk circumspectly. Look at the context around that. He causeth all, then he identifies all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Now, there's a number here, but he's identifying the fact that every that people from every kind of group, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. That's how the Bible identifies the word all. But it doesn't mean that every single human tissue on the planet takes that mark. It doesn't say that. It's actually identifying that this group and this group, this group and this group and this group and this group is taking the mark. And anyway, that no man might uh, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the, here it is, save he had the name of the beast or save he that had the mark or the name of the beast. Let me put this back up here. So here is your bionym. And, and what this is, is um, you wear this bracelet. And what it does is that it measures your, your unique heart signature. It's like a fingerprint, like a DNA mark. It reads your unique heart signature. And you no longer need passwords, pins, key cards, keys, nothing. Because with this device, with this bio name thing, you will now be able to buy and or sell with no cash, no credit card, no uh, PIN. Some people say PIN number. That's redundant. The word PIN means personal identification number. And so some people say, oh, just put in your personal identification number number. That's what PIN is. No PINs, no credit cards, no debit cards, nothing. This probably has some sort of Bluetooth or radio frequency ID thing on it that will uniquely identify you as the wearer of the bracelet or the one who has the NIM which is the name. And I thought that was very, very interesting. Human cyborgs, secret DNA codes, uh, you name it. We are d swabbing everybody for DNA. Why? I've, I've stipulated before, this is a theory of mine. I'm not building any doctrines on it as yet, not till I see it from the Scripture. Um, I think they're looking for something. I think they're looking for something. I don't know what it is they're looking for. I'm looking for it too, but I'm looking for it in the Bible. But I think they're looking for something. Uh, let me show you. Let's see. What else have I got in a little uh, mystery bag here? Uh, some things people sent me. Take a look at this one. You're going to like this one. Somebody sent me this. Hey, Pastor Mike, here it is. And some of you are going, are you talking about the snowman? I've always had a theory about snowmen. No. Take a look at, hang on here, let me put it up here. Take a look at this. What do you see? Some of you are going, oh, man, I'd love to have a good cup of coffee right now. One. Two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six here, six here, six here, and it's in this guy's hand. Uh, so whoever whoever sent this to me, you took the picture of it. Drop the coffee cup. Get it out of your hand. It's dangerous. No, I don't really believe you drink McDonald's coffee and you go to hell. Okay, I don't really believe that. Uh, what I do believe is that there is a very subtle indoctrination going on. 
Sixes are everywhere. Um, here's something a little bit more obvious. Uh, this is uh, some sort of journal, Molecular Biology and Evolution. And it's really interesting because these leaves, see that the tree is DNA, which I think is very, 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 very telling. Because this whole, this graphic here is based upon the Kabbalah tree of life, the Sephiroth. And I want you to notice that they made sure to include the roots here. And in Kabbalah, the tree of life is actually upside down. The roots are in heaven, and the leaves and everything are hanging down to the earth. It's an upside down tree. But the Kabbalah tree of life is actually a picture of DNA, but there's something in the DNA or added to the DNA that turns men, turns men into gods. Uh, the, the person who sent this to me noted that in the leaves, you probably can't see them there on the screen, but these leaves here, there's some, like here, there's an arrow pointing up. And in these, this leaf here, there's arrows pointing down. Here's one pointing down. Here's one pointing up. All the arrows are pointing either up or down. And this article or this periodical is called Molecular Biology and Evolution. And we are headed in that direction. Uh, let's see here. Here's an, oh, I just saw something here. I just saw something that I can do. I can do that. I didn't know I could do that before. That's pretty cool. I just learned a new trick. This is a store in a mall called Illumination 10. This right here, I want to use my new drawing tool. Isn't that cool? This is the Sephiroth, the tree of life. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are the ten kings or the ten horns or the ten toes, or they represent the curse of the Ten Commandments. Interposed between these ten divine circles, that's what they're called, you have these little uh, lines here. There are, let's see here, there are 22 of these lines here. That coincides with the Hebrew Aleph bet, but it also goes along with the uh, 22 amino acids that are DNA forms. When you add all these together, you get 22 plus 10, that's 32, but in the deepest parts of the Kabbalah, I think like right in here, there is a secret circle that's hidden. It's usually not revealed, but it's there. So that gives you like 33. And the name of the store is Illumination 10. Um, I don't, I can't remember. I think it's, uh, it seemed like it was in Sweden or something like that, somewhere way far away. Very interesting stuff today. Let's read some emails and study some scriptures. Uh, let me do this. David Gibson. Um, oh, I like it, David. Carbon. The You know, they call us carbon-based life forms. Carbon has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. Um, that's pretty cool. Apparently, you sent another email, and I don't see it somewhere in here. Anyway, we'll get to it. Let's talk about, let's see here. Mike says, hi, Pastor Mike. Mike from Prescott, AZ. Uh, sent you an email in a Facebook about a thought I had about John's vision, 666, and DNA. was wondering if you had any thoughts about my theory. Thank you and appreciate you. Uh, yes, Mike, here are my thoughts about your theory. I don't remember what it was. That's my thoughts. Uh, Resend re that to me. Um, I don't always see all the, all the emails 
Uh, sometimes I get way behind on Facebook stuff, um, and so you'll have to forgive me for that. So, Mike, send it to me again and again and again and again until I say, Mike, I got it, all right? Uh, by the way, that was the OK sign, which is what we commonly use. I was not making the Ouroboros symbol, all right? Um, Rachel says, hi, Pastor. Hope you and Sweetie Pie are well. Um, she is doing okay. Um, I, I've had this surgery before. She is still in a lot of pain, but she wears it well, but it's still pain. So she's at home today. Caleb is home with her and helping to take care of her. And then I'm going to be responsible for supper when I get home. So anyway, uh, let's see here. Uh, after your encouragement to, quote, feed constantly on Scripture, I was led to this website. It is an easy, free, downloadable zip file um, or just to listen online, the entire KJV Bible. I was so excited about being able to download it for uh, when the net goes down that I must share with all. Thanks for your faithful encouragement and love. Uh, praise the Lord for you. I appreciate that, Rachel. Uh, there's the link right there. Uh I don't know how to put that on the screen right now without showing everybody else's email. So uh, I would say wordproject.org. That's, that's what I can tell everybody. And you're telling me that you can listen to the King James Bible from there. You can download the audio. We also have uh, on DVD, it's the only place it would fit, all of the MP3 files of Alexander Scorby reading the King James Bible. It's about two and a half gigabytes worth of information. You can get it from us um, and uh, put it on your iPad, iPhone, Android, personal listening device. Uh, you can break it up and put it on three CDs, MP3 CDs. Uh, my father-in-law, Sterling, has an mp3 player in his truck that plays mp3 cds and he just pops those in there and he listens to the bible uh when he does his uh running around and uh so anyway uh let's see here sebastiano and tiffany say dear pastor mike i'm tired of people arguing with you on what is the right bible to use god made it simple he said it was the king james authorized version what's more simple than that Okay, love, Subby and Tiffany. Subby, I guess, would be Sebastiano. Um, and I'm assuming that you guys are Italian. Just, you know, I'm not trying to racial profile. Don't call me a racist. But you just have this hint of garlic about your name. All right, anyway. Uh, let's see here. You know what? Might as well. We're going to open up a can, okay? Um, and amazingly, I have to be extremely well-guarded um, and very careful and cautious how I approach this for more than one reason. Uh, one reason is, is that there are people out there whose conscience um, will not allow them to have anything to do with what is, what some people say is traditional or whatever on December 25th. Um, it is not my job. It is not my desire. It is not my, uh, my wish to grind something into you that, Maybe God has taken out. It's not my desire whatsoever. Uh, so I don't want I don't want anybody whose conscience and who people and there are people who've written me said I just feel like the Holy Spirit has has pulled me away from a lot of the stuff that people do on December twenty fifth. I am I believe you. I do. I I get it and I believe you. Um. But this question comes up every year in December. And I will say that there are some people who are nice about it. They, they want to try to inform people. Um, they feel like that, hey, you know, I found this stuff out and, you know, it's, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm wonderful with that. I think there's good information out there. 
There are some people, though, who have decided that if you give or receive a present on December 25th, that is equivalent to the mark of the beast, and especially now since they, you read their Facebook post, you are now obligated by God to cut it out. Whatever it is you do on December 25th, since you read their post, now you are obligated by God to have nothing to do with December 25th, crawl in a hole somewhere, and that's the end of it. Again, I'm not, I'm not, trying, to, um, I'm not trying to hurt people who legitimately say this is just this is what we've decided to do as a family. Uh, some people don't understand it. I do. I understand it and I get it. But there are people and the, Facebook is full of this stuff. Facebook is full of people who write down on their wall what it's going to take for you to be saved or truly godly in their eyes. I run into this stuff all the time, and I want you to know, you people tick me off. You make me angry is what you do. While you're there bragging about how close you are to God because there's no star on your Christmas tree, what is it? don't tell me what you don't do. Why don't you be honest and tell everybody on Facebook what you do. Because the same people, same people, and again, I'm, this is not directed at good Christian, saved by grace people who choose not to do anything of any traditional idea on December 25th. This is directed to people out there who they themselves make the rules up on who's going to heaven. And, of course, naturally, it excludes them because obviously they are because they posted this. Um, you make me angry. Um, there was a guy that, and you know my, I don't, I don't, I don't do Halloween. There was a guy that posted on Facebook a couple years ago and his wording was, if you call yourself a Christian and you have any capitalized, you know, that they yelled certain words, anything to do with Halloween, you are mocking Christ and you are rejecting the grace of God and his salvation. Uh, I wrote to him privately. Uh, he was, you know, one of these friends on Facebook. And I said... Um, you actually have no right to say that. You can't, you can't tell people that if, if, and he said anything, so I'm assuming if you gave a kid a piece of candy, you can't tell people that they're not saved because you made a rule that says if they break that rule, they're not saved. You're not allowed to do that. He immediately blocked me. And people were telling me, uh, have you seen what such and such been writing about Junus? No, he blocked me. He's telling everybody, you're, the, you're in the Illuminati. Well, no, I'm not. There are things, obviously, we should not be a part of, people. No doubt in my mind about it. But I think that in getting caught up in some of this stuff, you forget what grace is. You forget how people are saved. You also forget that people that really are saved have a master over them that is completely capable of dictating and directing his people's behavior and what it is they do. Romans. Now here's the question. Hi, Pastor Mike. What are your thoughts on Christmas trees, Santa, etc.? Now, I'll be honest with you, the Santa deal, I don't like Santa. No more. Used to. Okay? I don't like him. 
the older I get, the closer I get to the Word of God and to Christ, um, to me, anything that takes away from me celebrating and honoring my Lord Jesus at his first coming, anything that takes away from that, I don't like it. I'm an enemy of it. I am. I do not climb down the throats of people in my church who have said something to their children about Santa Claus. I don't do it. It's not because I'm afraid of them. It's just that I don't know of any child, three, four, five years old, that refuses to believe in Santa Claus. Maybe there are some. But we live in the world, and children at that age, in a young age, they, are, they have no way of discerning between fantasy and reality. And I'm not trying to be a psychologist or anything like that. I'm just saying most people are going to believe in it. Most little kids are going to believe in it no matter what. I'm not saying you have to enforce it, reinforce it, or whatever. But there are people out there who have made Santa Claus, Christmas tree, a wreath, even December 25th, they have made that as a test of, if I, if I see you say Merry Christmas on Facebook, I'm going to come out against you with fury and fire and venom, and I'm going to tell the world that you're not, that you're not going to heaven. There are people who do that. Um, I don't think you're doing the right thing. I really don't. Let's, let's talk about what God said. Okay? Let's talk about what God said as far as salvation goes. And is a person really saved? Are they really right with God? Um, let's see here. In Romans chapter 2, let's just go, let's just go some, let's just talk some scripture, shall we? Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. To those of you who have had someone rip you apart because you said, Merry Christmas, you know exactly what I'm getting at. Somebody judged you as being a Satanist, a pagan, an idolater, or whatever. They judged you this way. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. I don't put up a Christmas tree. Wonderful. I'm glad you don't. And I've heard that some people say, if you put up a Christmas tree, then you're an idolater, you're an idol worshiper. I've even read some people who said, see, because when you get the presents out of the tree, you have to kneel down in front of the tree to get it. And see, that's kneeling before an idol. I have to kneel down in front of my car to change the tire. That does not make me worship. I, in fact, if I have changed my tire, I guarantee I don't worship my car. I hate my car. But they would accuse you of being an idolater. And let me tell you what Paul said an idolater was. In fact, let's do this. Let's pull up our software here. PureBibleSearch.com is where you're going to find it. Let me switch the screen over here for you. And let's look for this verse. C-O-V-E-T-O-U-S-N-E-S-S. -E -S -S. Covetousness. You know what that word means? It means somebody who's lusting. Okay? Oh, here's a good verse. Jesus said, beware of covetousness. Beware of it. Romans chapter 1. It's part of... 
what's being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. Um, Ephesians 5, 3, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints. Colossians 3, 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is what? Idolatry. So here's my point. Here's my point. And again, I, I don't have, I, I think it's good that we go back and examine some of the things we do to see where they came from. Keep this in mind also. I have a saying that I use, pagans eat pancakes. Did you know that? Do you know pagans eat pancakes? Does eating a pancake make you a pagan? No. Does saying Merry Christmas to someone make you a Roman Catholic or make you a pagan? No, it doesn't. And so when we start, but, but learning about, learn, learning about, some of the traditions we use and, and the things that people have done over the years. I don't have a problem. In fact, I think probably there's some things we should learn about. But here's where you step across the boundary. Is when you have filled your mind with stuff. And then you look at other people. And you say. I believe or I know that you are not saved or you're not a Christian or that you're being a pagan because you do this. You have a Christmas tree in your house, therefore you are, you are hopelessly lost, you're not saved, you're going to be condemned, God's going to get you, uh, and I want to be around to see it. That's the attitude of some of these people. Romans chapter 2 tells you that you are just as inexcusable as you think they are. And here's what we like to do. I've done it to people, and it's wrong. You've done it to people, and it's equally as wrong. We like to examine other people's lives in hopes of finding something in them that we can crucify them with. Or it's like we dare them to give us some information about them so that we can lash into them. Or people have done this to me and they'll do it again. They will deliberately try to set me up and lay a trap for me, trying to get me to say something or do something. And in the past, I fell for it. I'm trying to be a little bit more circumspect now. But all they're wanting to do is find fault in someone else. For what reason? What reason would someone have for finding fault with you? I would think, and I know this because I've done it before, find fault with somebody else because that puts me up here because I didn't do what they did. Does that make sense to everybody? You take people, you accuse them of this and say, okay, you're a low life, you're a scumbag, you're no good. Since I didn't do what you did, that makes me up here. And I've heard people say, well, at least I didn't do that. Okay. Okay, you didn't. Here's what Romans 2 is saying. 
Wherefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And I'm telling you, who is it that is to be your judge? Is it your Facebook people? Is it your family members? Who is it that is your judge? It is to be God who is your judge, who will judge people in truth. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? So here's what you do. You judge people on the basis of what they do or you think they do on December 25th. Meanwhile, you're a drunk or you've been looking at pornography or your neighbor's daughter or your neighbor's wife or the lady at the supermarket or the guy who works on the road crew as you pass by or whoever it was. You were coveting after some guy or some gal or you looked at some of their stuff and coveted after it or you were watching TV and a commercial popped up and you said, boy, I'd like to have that. How come I can't have that? That's the 10th commandment, people. That's coveting. You're an idolater. And I've, I've told people before, yeah, you know, I think there's things that we can and should do in our marriages to safeguard ourselves against jumping in somebody else's bed. I think there's ways to be truthful with people and not lie. I think, you know, I think there are things that we can do uh, to try to keep from breaking the Ten Commandments. But as sure as I'm sitting here today, I have not as yet in, my, in 47 and a half years of my life ever figured out how to quit coveting something. I don't know how to, I don't know how to quit. And you know what that makes me? It makes me a lawbreaker. And there is no amount. And here's, I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear me out real good. There is no amount of good things that I can do that will change the fact that I break God's law. And the Bible is very clear on this. If you don't keep all of the laws, you have broken all of the law. The Bible's very clear on that. And I, I have changed and tried to change my mind and my life and how I think about people and how I treat people based upon the Scriptures. Because I used to say, well, at least I didn't do that. I've never done that before. Bless God, I don't do that. And it, I, what I'm trying to do is elevate myself by putting other people down. I've done it before, and so have you. And so here is God's law, and we can probably list a few things that we don't break God's law in. Does that mean that we should go around looking for other people who are breaking God's law in ways that we don't and condemn them and say, you're not saved, you're a pagan, you're not Christian, you're going to hell, um, you don't know anything about God, and, and all the accusations that come out against people from, not from the government, not from the liberals, not from the pagans themselves, but from other people who say they're Christians. That's where, that's where people are getting it from. And what I'm telling you is, you have no right you know what God honors, and, and I'm, I'm being totally honest here, you know what, and many of you know this. You've, you've helped someone 
who you see in a state or a situation in life or in some sin that you also have been in. And you don't go to them and say, slap, slap, slap. What are you thinking? What are you, you idiot? You call yourself a Christian and you do this? You don't do that to them. They may come to you and they say, you know, I, I, man, I need help. What's going on? And they tell you and you say, yeah. Yeah, I've been there. I've been there. Uh, thank God, by the grace of God, he, God's keeping me. God's giving me grace. God's helping me. But I'm right there with you. I don't see a lot of that going on in social media, especially in regards to December 25th. I don't see a lot of that going on. What I see a lot of is accusations and judging and I hate you and you're not really a Christian and now that you know what I told you, you have no excuse. And I'm here, I'm telling you, the Bible has just told you you yourself do not have an excuse. You don't have an excuse. Period. And so that is how God sees every human being, Christian or not. God has concluded all of us under sin. The next thing that some people would say to me, and I know this because this is what they said. So, okay, pastor, are you saying that we can just sin and do whatever we want to and not have to worry about pleasing God and it's going to be, and we can still be saved? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you probably something that's missing. Out of your doctrine of who God is and how he saves people and how he treats them, I know that God gives people pastors. I get it. I'm one of them. God took me out of the business a long time ago of thinking that I was to be God's policeman. And, and I had, like the NSA thinks they have a right to do. By the way, there was a judge that ruled against the NSA based on this uh, uh, Snowden stuff. A judge ruled against the NSA. It's probably going to go to the Supreme Court and basically said that all of this intelligence gathering that the NSA was doing of cell phones and emails and, and Internet searches and everything like that was unconstitutional. And I agree. But anyway, I used to think as a young man and a young pastor, that it was my responsibility to police everybody that was under me to make sure that they always followed the rules all the time. What I, what I was refusing to do and it, refusing to admit to myself was, was while that I was looking at other people to make mistakes, I was not including myself as one of the people who make mistakes and do things that are wrong. I was not doing that. And God has since pulled me out of being the policeman and being the executor of his judgment by telling, oh, you did what? You were singing in the elevator a Lady Gaga song? <sighs> God took me out of that business. That's not me. Some pastors think that that's them. I don't have an answer for that. I'm just telling you, that's not me. And so I don't think that I have to go around policing everybody and making my list of who I think is naughty and nice. I don't think I have to do that. Because here's why. Here's what I know beyond any doubt whatsoever. And here's what I, I hope you understand about me. I have a father. I happen to have a very wealthy father. But I have a father who knows everything there is to know about me. I mean everything. 
He knows everything about me. He loves me. He cares about me. And he has taught me over the years, Mike, I love you. I've always had mercy on you. I have always forgiven everything that you've ever done, said, thought, every one of them. And I'm going to continue doing that. But I'm telling you right now, my son, if you think for a second that I'm going to let you get away with some things, you're crazy. And I'm telling you that right now. I'm just kind of, these are not exact words that God has said to me, but I will show you from the scriptures why you don't, number one, have the job of policing everybody, and number two, you don't need the job of policing everybody. Here's why you don't. Um, Hebrews 12, 5. I'll let you turn your Bibles there. You know what? Let me, let me pull it up on the screen here. Let me, uh, I'll show you. I, I, I like to do this because I like to show everybody how the, and I'm still learning some things, and I asked Donna a question. Uh, she wrote the software and wrote a book on it, and Donna, I don't read books, okay? I mean, I don't read instruction manuals. I'm a man. You ought to know that. Um, but I asked her a question, and she said, oh, silly boy, didn't you read the manual? And I went and read the manual, and I went, Oh, that's what that's for. So now I know how to do it. Here's what the Bible says. Verse Hebrews 12, 5. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Stop right here. Is there anybody left out of that? No. Now, I'll tell you this. The people who do get away with everything in life, the people who seemingly never get corrected by God, they're going to hell. That's where they're going. You know why? The Bible says they're a bastard. And it's not just saying that because God's mad at them. God is saying that they are not going to receive the inheritance. That's what the scripture says. And I want to say this to you, okay? If they won't accept God's chastening, what makes you think they're going to take yours? They're not. I mean... I am. I have asked God to beat me for certain things. I have. God, you better get me for that one. I don't want to do that again. And he has. I take the chastening and the chastisement of my father. I take it. Because I know what he's trying to do in me, and that's exactly what I want done. But somebody else coming in off the street, coming in here during Pastor Mike Online with a belt or a rod in their hand and starts whipping on me, I'm not taking that. There's no way in the world I'm taking that from you or whoever. But I'll take you. You know why I won't take it from people? Because I don't think they love me. If you want to beat on me, I got to know you love me. You want to take a rod after me and correct me? I let my wife do it. You know why? Because I know she loves her husband. She wants her husband right. She wants someone that she can look up to. And so I'll let her get after me. 
but I don't let just anybody do it. And you know what? You don't either. And the truth of it is the people that you're lashing out against, they don't have to listen to that from you because you don't love them. I let God do it because I trust him and I know he loves me. And here's my point in this. And again, this is not to the people who have made a decision. This is how we're going to spend December 25th. This is what we want to do. This is we're going to we're going to try to honor and please God. I get it, and I admire you for that. But what I'm telling certain others are or is one of the two. You're treating people poorly. You're not following the scriptures, though you say you are. You're judging people when you yourself are just as guilty of breaking God's law as anybody else is. And if you think that you have to be the one to straighten everybody out, I'm telling you, I have a God, and that's his job. And here's what I'm convinced, even about people in my own church, I will, I, and even with my own children, have I corrected my children? Absolutely. Did I whip them? Oh boy, you bet. And they took it. As they grew older, however, dad realized that there was a time when dad couldn't take a belt to him anymore. So you know what dad did? Dad had to learn how to trust God to correct my children. That was, a, that was a hard one for me and Lisa. But there was a point where we turned our children over to the Lord and said, God, they're yours. Do what pleases you and honors you. And let me just, I like to be at rest. I really do. I like for Christians to just rest in Christ. And I want to say to you, I want to appeal to you, If they belong to God, don't you think that God has a way of getting a hold of his children, his own people, that doesn't require you? Don't you think that? I mean, let's just be honest, okay? There are things about me that most people don't know. My wife knows. People close to me. I mean, I'm just talking about you don't you see me on this side of the camera, but you're not around me every day. The people that work here, Gary and Kay and my my girls and Rose, okay, they know me. Okay. You don't know me. God knows me. And God knows how to take me. And correct me when he knows that I've done something wrong. And God has done that. And here's my point. There are things in my life that no one on the outside has ever corrected me over. Do you know why? They don't know me. And what I'm saying is, I think God has done a great job changing me and correcting me. When I, when I changed my mind that the King James was right, it wasn't any human being that convinced me of that. Not one. It was God that did it. And I think he did a pretty good job of it. And here's my point. Don't you think that there are people out there that are asking God every day, God, show me the truth. God, show me the truth. God, show me. Reveal to me how you want me to live. Don't you think that God is God enough to be able to take care of them and do that for them and help them? I think he is. In fact, that's what the Bible's saying here. The Lord, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If God sees me step out of line, he will get me for it. 
he'll either tug on me and say, Mike, uh uh-uh. But if I continue to pull away from him, God's not going to let me go. He's going to tear me up until I repent. That's what he's going to do. And that's what his grace really is all about. That has nothing to do with works. It's not earning my salvation. It's not uh, uh, these people who say, oh, you say repent? Uh, your work salvation. Heretic. Idiot. Hey, that's just part of it, Jack. When God's whipping on you, you repent. Now, let me address the email with Scripture. The principle Scripture that people give uh, concerning, let's say, concerning um, Christmas trees. Uh, Let's just deal with that. Jeremiah 10. Let's go to Scriptures, okay? Jeremiah 10, verse 1. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, be not dismayed at the signs of the heathen, or at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Signs of heaven, I would, I would think, include like uh, astrology and things like that. They are dismayed at them. I'm not. Okay? Um, people are making a big deal about these blood moons. Four, four blood moons are coming. That's the sign of the rapture. I don't know. I, it just doesn't sound right to me. So I'm not worried about it. And then he said in verse 3, For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, a work of the hands of the workman with the axe. Now, here's what I'm here's what I'm asking you to do. Is it wrong for someone to cut down a tree? The answer is no. Obviously no. Then verse 4. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish, the stock is a, is a doctrine of vanities. If you study the word stock in the scriptures, uh, the stock is a doctrine of vanities. Um, verse, look at verse 11. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When you read Jeremiah 10 in its entirety, walk circumspectly around it, and then walk circumspectly around the entire of the Bible. Don't don't leave anything out. You see that they were cutting down a tree. They decked it with silver and gold because that's what they did. They were fashioning an image of a god. And they were worshiping this god. That's that's what it's saying here. They were worshiping this god, and they were believing that this god provided them things, gave them things. Gave them rain, gave them uh, uh, wind to blow, gave them whatever, gave them grain and harvest time or whatever. That's what they were believing. That's why God said, um, The gods have not made the heavens into the earth, and they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Okay? Now, I can see the point that some make concerning a Christmas tree. I can see it. I'm not denying it. I'm not trying to say that does not have nothing to do with it. I can see it. I've read I've read Manly Hall and what he said um, about the idea that the God was hidden in the tree. That's true. 
That does not make all trees evil. Doesn't make them. It doesn't doesn't make all trees evil. Let me read you scripture. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now I'm going to ask you, who is that describing? Not me. I mean, I'd like for it to describe me. But it's not describing me. Who is it describing? There is a man that has never walked in the counts of the ungodly, has never stood in the way of sinners, has never sat in the seat of the scornful, and his delight was always in the law of the Lord, and in his law did he meditate day and night. There is a man who qualifies under that. His name is Jesus Christ. So what does Psalm say concerning Jesus? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Did Jesus ever compare himself to a tree? Oh, absolutely. Think of what he said in uh, in John. I am the vine. You're the branches. A vine is a type of a tree. It's a type of vegetation. And Jesus compared himself. He didn't say, I am like that. He said, I am the vine. And you're the branches. And what I'm saying is, just because it's a tree doesn't mean that people are bowing to the Antichrist. I don't think for a second that people think that they're getting presents from the gods from a Christmas tree. I don't think people think that. But I can also see where people are going, you know what, I'm just not comfortable with that thing anymore. I just, I don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. And I get it. So now we go to, let's pull it up here. Let's look for it, okay? Uh, Let's see here. Uh, Holy days. Let's see if we can find that here. Nope. Holy day. Maybe that's what we're looking for. Nope, that's not what we're looking for. What are we looking for? Uh, I'm looking for the passage, meat or drink. Is that it? No. Ah, here it is, Colossians 2. Let's go back up to verse 14. Let's walk around this verse. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore, the therefore is what was given here. God has forgiven you all trespasses. He blotted them out. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of in of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. That's the first place I wanted to go to. Where's that second one? What am I trying to think of? Um, regard. It's talking about where the Bible's talking about one man regardeth the day. Let's see here. Where, you know, where are you? Let's see here. Romans 14. Watch this. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks." 
For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. And so let me, let me stop right here. Okay? Aside, let's take, the, let's take the Christmas tree thing and just kind of put it over to the side here. Uh, because there are some people who are trying to tell you that if you have any sort of celebration or an observance on or about December 25th, you're a pagan, you're not going to heaven, there's something wrong with you, and on and on and on and on. There is no scripture. Number one, there is no scripture that ordains a feast day or a celebration of Christ coming on December 25th. It does not exist. There's no commandment that says we have to do this. So if those of you who don't, you don't. There is also no scriptural condemnation to those who out of a free will and a choice choose to set aside a day to honor the Lord at his coming. His coming is clearly noted and written of in two of the four Gospels. Matthew and Luke wrote extensively of the birth and the surrounding events of the Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to his second coming. There are people who, by way of either tradition or by way of after they thought about it, they said, you know what? I want to do this because I want to do it. The Hoggard family will gather together and we won't do nothing else until dad, me, we read the scriptures. And I got to talk a little bit because I can't just read scriptures and not talk. We've been doing that for years. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I, I've even had, I've even read people who said, you can do that on any other day. You just can't do it on December 25th. And I'm going, why? They said, because that's the devil's holiday. No, well, no, it's not. Show me that in the scripture. Well, that's, you know, when the pagans did this. So did you know the pagans did stuff on March 3rd? The pagans do stuff on uh, this day, and the pagans do stuff on that day. Who made the day? God did. And that's what Paul was getting at here. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And the person, the people who do not have some sort of December 25th practice or custom that they participate in, that's their mind. That's what they want to do. And it doesn't bother me that they're not doing it. The same scripture applies to those that do. I do. Was it by tradition? Yeah, I mean, that's the way it grew up. But is it also now not by choice? It is by choice. And I'm telling you that there is no way in the world that I am going to shy away from telling people what was at one time, well, I don't know if I can say that. For centuries and for peoples all over the world, December 25th was not about anything but a celebration of the birth of Christ. Most people in history, in the church age, had no knowledge of some of the pagan origins of some of the things that happened on that day. They had no knowledge of that. To them, it was nothing but purely a celebration of the coming of Christ and the salvation of mankind. That's what it always was for most people, not all, most people. They did it with a pure conscience. So do I. 
I do it because I choose to, because there are people around me who say, well, yeah, you know, Christmas, Merry Christmas, Christmas is coming up. What are you going to get for Christmas? I don't know what's Christmas all about. Let me tell you what it's all about. I was standing behind a guy one time that, that was on Good Friday. Now, I don't believe in Good Friday. I don't think there's any way in the world that Christ could have been crucified on Friday and rise up a day later on Sunday morning. I believe in the first day of the week. I don't believe it happened. On, I don't believe the crucifixion happened on Friday. But he's asking, what is Good Friday anyway? I don't have any idea. I didn't come back at him and said, it's a pagan holiday. People who do that are going to have This guy had no idea what anything, Easter or Good Friday, had anything to do. You know what I told him? I said, well, I was standing in line with him, and I said, well, uh, there, are some, there are some people who believe that this was the day that commemorates the death of Jesus Christ on the cross because Christianity teaches that all men sin and violate God's law. But God provided his son, and the death on the cross was his son paying the price for our sins so that you and I don't die and go to hell. And he went, oh, huh. I gave him the gospel. I didn't go into rant and rave about paganism and what I know about the Easter bunny and eggs and all that. That's not what he asked. And that's not the answer I was going to give him. There is no way in the world that I'm going to shy away from anybody. And if I get the opportunity, I'm going to tell what the Bible says in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke about the coming of my Savior, Jesus Christ, And just because we know for a fact that December 25th more than likely was not the day that it took place, big deal. That's what people are looking for at this time of year, and that's what I'm going to give them. Now, again, if your conscience and you feel like the Holy Ghost is segregating you from that, you have my full endorsement my full blessing, as if you need it, but I want you to know that I am not your enemy. Likewise, leave people alone and let God deal with their conscience. You are not the Holy Spirit, neither am I. And there are situations that I've had over the years in this church where I have simply said to myself and to God, God, you deal with it. God, you teach them. God, you talk to them. God, you say something to them because I don't know that I can. So I don't know if I I don't know if I made a mess of this. I don't know if I said everything that was right and correct. I don't know. What I do know is that I don't think that it's my job to beat people over the head with their own Christmas tree. I don't think that's my job. So, um, Stephen, thanks. Thanks for bringing it. Thanks a lot, Stephen, for bringing it up. Okay? And you know what? I am going to have to deal with this again next year. I'm going to have to deal with it. And I'm going to say the same thing unless God takes me someplace else. And I am very happy to let God do that. You could say of me, Hoggard's a pagan, God-worshipping idolater. Let me tell you what you could have said about me 19, 1995, 1996, you could have said about me in 1996, Mike Hoggard is a King James Bible-hating, NIV, error-believing preacher that wants to be like Rick Warren and had a rock and roll band in his church. That's what you could have said about me back then, and it would have been true can't say that about me anymore because that's not me I've grown and I'm still growing 
and I'm content to let God bring the increase in other people's life too. I'm content with that. All right? Uh, let's see here. Isaiah writes and says, Pastor Mike, to that person who goes around finding faults in others, there's Roman 14, 4. Let me read that scripture. Would have been easier, Isaiah, for you to just write it out for me. Now I got to look it up. Romans 14, 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master, we read that while ago. He standeth or falleth, yea, he should be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. I appreciate you saying that. Um, let's see here. Pat. How you doing, Pat? Your sermon today was exactly what I needed. I judge others. Shame on me. I think I'm God's policeman. Shame on me, because I thought that that's what I was supposed to do, and I frankly haven't liked the job. It's too much to carry. Thank you, Pat. And I know, Pat, I know, I know who you are. I mean, I'm not telling everybody your name, but I know who you are. When I had this, when I said all this, I didn't have you in mind. I promise you I didn't because I didn't know this about you. So thank you, Jesus, for telling me to set, set it down and stop doing that. What a really, and I'm telling you, it is a relief. I'm t- there are people out there who are so mad at everybody because they think nobody's doing right, and why won't they listen to me? I keep telling them about that. They won't listen to me. And they spend their whole, it's like they're miserable. Why can't you just let it go and let God have it? It's a lot easier to carry. I promise you it is. Um, Mike. Just to correct you on the star of the east, you said, you, you've you said, where is he whose star shines in the east? I don't remember that, but I'm not saying I didn't. Maybe I did. Uh, there is That is not a scripture in the KJV. I think you were quoting from Matthew 2, 2, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For if we have seen his star in the east. And I do know that. Okay, I do know that verse. And... That's what happens when you only think you're telling what the Bible says. So I received the correction. Thank you very much. Uh, Let's see here. Who else here? Chris. I have a question. I have, I, I don't mind Christmas. But I don't do Santa Claus. I believe he takes away from Christ. Ask kids these days what Christmas spirit is. They say it is Santa. So I keep him out of the light, and that is for Jesus. Is this correct? I I am with you 100% on that one, Chris. I am. I am. I have also, and you don't, I mean, you don't have to, um, uh, having raised little children, in this world of them being constantly bombarded with images of the Coca-Cola Santa Claus, I'm telling you, there's hardly any way in the world. And if you have found a way as a parent, more power to you. But there's hardly any way in the world to keep them from at least visualizing Santa Claus coming down the chimney at Christmas time, putting Uh, gifts under the tree. It's hard to get them to not do that. It is a natural product of how their mind works. It's like invisible friends that kids have. Matthew had an invisible friend. We didn't chastise him and say, he's not real. We didn't do that. We knew that at a certain age, he was going to grow out of that. And he did. No harm, no harm done to him whatsoever because he visualized an invisible friend. It's no big deal. Same thing with it in little children. They, it's going to be something that they are going to do. You don't have to emphasize it. 
you can, as parents, say, look, there are going to be presents here. We gave them to you. Okay? Be my guest. And I agree with you, Chris. I think that the whole Santa thing, he has stolen what in many people's minds Christmas was all about. He stole that. And I get it. I certainly do. And so I am one of these. If we say that we are Christians and we're going to have an observance on December 25th, I say that we do everything that we can to make it as much about Jesus Christ as we possibly can. And then why not do it every day? Why not? but it would get awfully expensive buying gifts for everybody every day of the year. Um, Amethyst writes in and says, literally, the only reason I stopped Christmas after my boys left home was because of the fighting and stresses it caused within the family. Good point. I get it because it's, it has become so commercialized with Black Friday and all the ignorant nonsense that goes on with the shopping and the merchandising and stores realizing that they call it Black Friday because most, I won't say most of their income, a large percentage of their yearly profit is going to come from Christmas shoppers. That's why they call it that. And it has gotten outrageously insane to where now it has encroached on another free will holiday that the Bible does not command us to participate in, and yet we do willfully, and that is Thanksgiving here in America. Free will holiday. Why not? And I am one of these... If it's called Thanksgiving, I think that's what we ought to do. I think we ought to bow our heads and give God thanks for what he's done for us. Anyway, uh, and it did not matter if we gave them boys a $200 Christmas or a $1,000. Can I be your child? $1,000 Christmas. They were never happy. That doesn't include the things within my extended family. When I was young, Christ was all over Christmas. But I saw a huge change throughout my entire family when I had kids. Christ was no longer there. What's the sense? Cheryl, I'm with you, sister. I am. It has gotten way, way out of hand. Um, Eric, how you doing, Eric? Pastor Mike, I agree with you on not slamming people on what they do on Christmas. Here's what I feel people should read and decide for themselves. I like it what they should do. Please explain these verses. And I did. I went over these verses. Okay. Um, again, I agree with you, but I also think I should give scripture explaining why I don't do it for myself. And he has Jeremiah 10, one through four, uh, Jeremiah 11, and there they burn incense and all the high places, Jeremiah 10, 11, uh, in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away from before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger for they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Um, and then Isaiah 57, 5, Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs, under the cliffs of the rocks. And you'll, you'll find that a lot in Scripture, under, the, under every green tree, under every green tree, every green tree. Does that make the symbol of an evergreen tree uh, something that is uniquely wicked. Uh, I would have to say no, because Solomon uh, built the temple out of cedar, the cedars of Lebanon, which is a which is an evergreen tree. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't want to say, well, we can do anything as long as our heart's in the right place, because obviously I don't believe that. Uh, but again, and Eric, I, you know, I mean, you make a good point here, and I'm not in, I, I don't, I'm not in disagreement with how you're seeing the scripture here. Um, and I like what you said here about not hitting everybody over the head with it. But there are people out there 
who, if they see you with this or a, like a lapel pin that says Merry Christmas or something like that, in their minds, you're a pagan. You need to be informed. And now that I've informed you, you better start doing what I told you to do or you're not going to heaven. Those kind of people I got no time for whatsoever. None. You, I, I don't know. This seems like they can't be reached with reality and sense. It's like saying someone who eats a pancake, you're a pagan because I saw pagans eating pancakes. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose of eating pancakes is to put food in your stomach. Duh. Uh, anyway, uh, let every man, as the Scripture says, be convinced in his own mind. And God is the only right judge that we have. Mike, please, are you kidding? This is uh, Valentina. Thou judgest, you're going to bring up that old chestnut? Chestnuts are pagan, by the way. Sounds like the only scripture the Sodomites use when you confront them with their sin. No, not, not sounds like. Not sounds like, Valentina. I read scripture. Clear scripture. That's what I did. You comparing me to a sodomite? Really? Mike, first we examine ourselves and the beams in our own eyes, then we may then we may remove the moat, yes, moat, not splinter, out of our brother's eyes. KJV does not contain the word splinter. Okay. Please, Mike, when you're being corrected by a friend, don't always take it as a personal attack. I'm not. I'm not. My problem is, Valentina, when people write me emails, if I don't know them, I don't know that you're my friend. I don't know you. I will let my friends come to me who I know and trust, love me and care about me, and say things to me. But there are a lot of people that I don't let you do that because all you're after is to attack. That's all you're after. If you prove yourself to be my friend, come here and let's talk. But I've got just as many people out there who hate my guts, who want to find fault in me, as people who say they are my friends, and I don't know that they are. So forgive me if you think I'm not doing something right here but I will let God and the people that I trust tell me what I'm doing wrong. But not people I don't know. You don't do that either. You, nobody does that. Nobody lets just people come in off the street and say, hey, you're doing this and I, you're wrong and you need to listen. Nobody lets anybody do that. Uh... There's a lot more here. By the way, you should give children more credit than not being able to know the difference between fairy tales and truth. Um, how about if you bring up your children without fairy tales that you were raised to them in truth only that you have never lied to them since they were born? I have five kids and they've always been taught truth only. No Santa Easter Bunny or Tooth Fairy or they know it's not that hard. Peace be upon thee. All right. Um, anyway, I am never going to win with this topic. Never. Never going to win with this topic. So if you think I'm wrong in how I handled it today, tell God on me. Okay? Tell God on me. God will come whip me if I'm wrong. I promise you he will. All right? So we will do something else on Thursday. That's Thursday, by the way. We'll see you. Bye.